Hello and welcome to our look ahead to what the papers will be bringing us tomorrow morning. With me, the writer and broadcaster Vicky Beeching and Gideon Stanley of the London Evening Standard. Thanks very much for going through the papers. Let's just have a quick look through the papers that we have, starting with the Mail, its main story, claiming that money from the Princess Diana Memorial Fund has been used to subsidise a campaign to promote positive views about immigration. The Independent headlines what it calls the Ding Dong at the BBC over the controversial song The Wizard of Oz used by anti-Thatcher campaigners. The Telegraph has more details of her funeral next Wednesday, while the Daily Mirror goes to something else, headlining the child sex charges faced by Coronation Street actor Michael Lavelle. The Express goes for a weather story, two months worth of rain to fall in a week it says, while the Sun concentrates on the Ding Dong story from one of the original Wizard of Oz actors who sang that song used by anti-Thatcher campaigners. The Times reports claims that chemical weapons have been used in Syria, while The Guardian claims the big six energy firms have been accused of cold-blooded profiteering. So let's begin uh, looking at the papers there with Vicky and Gideon. Uh, thanks both of you for, uh, we've got a few more papers and uh, a bit more detail, a bit more time to go through them now. Um, Vicky, let's just kick off with The Guardian. Uh, ding dong the BBC to cut Thatcher protest song short. Yes, this is really The Guardian's take on a story that we're finding on many of the pages and uh, they're quite negative about uh, Tony Hall and his decision. They call it a fudge and uh, they're really comparing him to his predecessor, George Entwistle, saying that he desperately doesn't want to make the same mistake and so as a result he's firefighting and they're making it sound like yeah. somewhat needlessly. And, and a big yeah. test for the new DG just a few days into his job, Gideon. And um, what, do you, what do you think about the fact that he actually issued his own statement having held uh, talks with uh, the heads of radio? Well, I mean, it's an important uh, news event, um, the Thatcher um, death, and you could argue it's the only news event of the week because not much else has been happening, and I don't mean because the papers have just been focusing on this. Um, well, uh, the DG, apart from career, perhaps. Uh, well, yeah. right. you're, not, you're, <laughs> not see, like you're not seeing it in the papers. I mean, it's your main story, but it's yeah. not in the papers, yeah. I can, or not on the front it's pages the of anything. Not, yeah. not tomorrow. Yeah. Um, you know, the Director General needs to be seen to get a grip, and, uh, you know, most of the papers seem to think it's some sort of fudge, but equally, I think there's a recognition that it's, it would look and sound stupid not to um, air this song at all. After all, if lots of people have gone out and bought it, then, uh, look, it's, uh, that's a, a way that people who didn't like Margaret Thatcher um, can express their feeling, and maybe better that than having a noisy protest at, at the funeral. Okay, but but the scientific of uh, a five minute, a four, sorry, four second, five second news item. I mean, that's mm, going to sit quite strange. strange in your view. I think so. I mean, the Guardian rightly points out that the Radio One target audience is 16 to 24 year olds. Most of them, you know, obviously weren't alive when Thatcher was in uh, office. And I and yeah, a lot of the protesters, though, Gideon, true, uh, exactly. have, have have been you exactly, know the were born party. after uh, yeah. Margaret Thatcher left her. Well, my, I've got a daughter who's 10. She listens to Radio 1, and I actually think that between now, today, the decision, and Sunday with the charts, um, things, uh, it, it will be a chance where, where actually the listeners will get educated. It's quite funny because The Guardian talks about the BBC explaining to younger viewers of Radio 1. Now, I know that the top 10 is webcast, and you get to see it, and you get to see the presenter present the top 10. So I think it is going to be interesting, and it's a chance, an interesting chance, to use, um, uh, to, to explain this to younger viewers who probably, or, and, sorry, and listeners, who are unlikely to be watching the mm. paper review at half past 11 tonight. You'd be but surprised. They, you'd, be surprised. You'd, be, exactly. you'd be surprised. Um, it seems untimely, because if, if the premise is that they wouldn't know about Margaret Thatcher anyway and they wouldn't make the correlation, surely it only worsens the situation for people to then draw attention to the reason why the song's in the charts. Why not just play the song, let it go on, yeah. and they'll be thinking, oh, that's kind of random, but, you know, they probably wouldn't care. Well, do you know, a pretty invidious position, actually, um, for the control of Radio 1, because, you know, damned if you do, damned if, damned, damned if you don't. Let's just, uh, we'll, we'll come back to this in a minute, but let's just look at the Sun headline, great headline, Munchkin Fury at Maggie Ding Dong Song, uh, and a bit of, you know, a bit of interesting journalism here. And just to give it a, a, a new twist, really, um, Vicky, they, they've got hold of this, this, this character who took part in the original film. Yeah, so if you look at this red circle here, you see somebody here playing one of the Munchkins, and uh, they've discovered that it was, in fact, Ruth Dutch 
Puccini, aged 94. Right. He was quoted as saying that nobody deserves to be treated like this. So uh, my take on this is just that they were desperate for their own spin, so they've you yeah. know hunted out a munchkin and uh, well, they, well, they've got she's enough. Given to, us one they, sentence. They've got <laughs> enough to fill pages four and five. So true. And, know, and the headline <laughs> really is priceless. That's my favourite headline of, of the night. Well, it's do you know, Gideon? Not not a bad one coming up in the Independent either. Do you think? Uh, the, the ding dong ding dong will end without a sing song. Um, that's the headline. Uh, so what will they complain about next? Well, I'm, there will, I guarantee there'll be plenty to complain about between now and Wednesday on the Thatcher funeral, depending on who who you um, talk to. I think this song. I mean, it's interesting. It's the reason it's captured the imagination of the sort of newspaper headline writers. Is um, it says something about. Um, the Thatcher, uh, sort of everything surrounding her death, the fact that 23 years after she stepped down, she there is this sort of visceral debate. Mm. Mm. And from that point of view, when people look back on this in a few weeks' time and in a few years' time, this little row about this song will still mm. mean something. And not even a song. I mean, it's, it's, well, it's, it's 45 seconds or something in the yeah. film, I think, originally, isn't it? From yeah, so, what I can yeah and now yeah. we're only going to get five seconds of 45 seconds. Uh, exactly. Yeah, my or, hope or, is really... Or, or maybe four. Or maybe yeah. four, if we're lucky. But um, I really hope that this is people's outlet so that when Wednesday comes around, people have got their kind of angst out of their system so that we don't have, you know, too many violent protests to deal with. Yeah, and... Uh, Better huge, a song huge, than a riot. Exactly, <laughs> huge security operation, of course, for that uh, funeral. Uh, look, another story in The Independent here, the uh, Andrew Wakefield research, which has been discredited and completely sort of disproved, but MMR scare doctor, I'm not to blame for measles. Uh, he's now living in the States, isn't he, Gideon? Um, living and working in the States, I think. Yes, the key point about Wakefield is that um, in 19, 1998, he, he suggested there was a link between MMR, the MMR vaccine and bowel disease and autism, um, that has subsequently been discredited, but um, there's now a big measles outbreak in Wales, uh, 693 cases, the highest number in a decade, and uh, it's the legacy of 15 years ago, lots of uh, families not getting their kids vaccinated. And it's an interesting story, and to be honest, with uh, the Easter holidays coming to an end, kids going back to school on Monday, some parents will be thinking about this. Yeah, because I'll just come to you in a moment, but we've just had a statement from the Department for Health. Uh, Dr. Andrew Wakefield's claims are highly incorrect. Immunisation advice from the department has always kept the interests of patients paramount. Measles is a highly infectious and harmful disease. If your child hasn't had two doses of MMR, whatever their age, we urge you to contact your GP surgery and make an appointment. So, uh, again, absolutely saying that, you know, that is, that, that, is, that is incorrect, even this is what he's promoting now in the United States. Uh, Vicky, herd immunity, vital here. Uh, mm. and young babies now at risk because children in their early teens haven't got that protection. I know, it's such a difficult one because when, when that scare first came out, obviously mothers were very protective over their, their babies at the time and you can understand, can't you, and have sympathy for wanting to protect your baby from a potential threat of autism or bowel disease. I mean, it's just a normal motherly instinct. So it's just a really, really tough one. People have been asking questions of whether immunisation should actually be enforced and uh, at the end of the day, it's just it's very easy to sympathise with people who hear a rumour, even if it's just a rumour, and want to protect their child, but end up actually putting them at risk. So, Good. unfortunate. Gideon, on, on to the Times. And, uh, well, the main story, uh, chemical weapons used in Syria, the first evidence. Now, it had been claim and counterclaim, hadn't it, by uh, rebels and uh, forces lords of Bashar al-Assad that they'd used them, uh, the other side had used them. Um, mm. This appears to, to confirm that actually some sort of chemical weapon has been used. Yes, um, essentially the Times story is saying that um, the scientists at Port and Down in Wiltshire, which is an important chemical and biological um, research place run by the MOD, has found some sort of traces from a soil sample smuggled out of Syria. Yeah. And um, you know, the story is a bit short on um, facts, if I'm honest, but uh, I think that the Times wouldn't put it on the front page if they weren't fairly confident. And the, I know that um, the uh, Foreign Office has actually put out a statement, which yeah. we all have here, mm -hmm. um, in which um, they say that um, they are deeply concerned about the multiple reports alleging the use of chemical weapons in Syria. And we were talking earlier about North Korea. That's uh, got a lot of attention recently. Uh, and Syria is, is forgotten uh, up to an extent. And I think the Times is right to um, put this on the front page because at the G8 meeting, which mm -hmm. has been going on, everyone knows that Syria is a massive, massive issue which has not really gone away. If it's a legacy of the Arab Spring two years ago, and it's still ongoing. And, and, and Vicky, the international community has made clear that actually this would be a line 
that would have been crossed Absolutely. and, and, and yeah. could s significantly change the way this yes, national community Yes, but part of the problem react. that this, this highlights is though that we don't actually know whether it's um, President Assad's regime or the rebels who've yeah. used these, so it's actually very difficult for people to know what to do. Well, that's, that's the same confusion yeah. as, as we had, what, three or four weeks ago? Exactly, yeah. and the states have said, as you rightly say, that um, the use of these chemical weapons would be a red line issue, but it's very difficult for them to know what to do if they're not really sure whose hands these are in. Nice picture on the uh, front of the uh, Times, uh, even though it doesn't feel that spring-like weather-wise, uh, it's just quite nice to see these sheep. Uh, in fact, they look as if, you know, when sort of rams um, take sheep, you know, they, they, they use a rattle, don't they? And so they often have yes. sort of marks on the, on, on the back. But I was quite curious about it. I actually, I actually Googled it when I was out waiting in the, in the green room, and um, apparently dying sheep's quite common. Didn't really yeah. know this. But um, apparently it's preventing sheep rustling, and it's a way that they, uh, they count them. So often they'll dye them in batches of 100. Oh, Isn't yeah. that fascinating? Okay. So it's not like dying budgerigars and things like that, no, which, is and cruel, um, which is cruel. This no, is but there was actually yeah. a quote on Google I found from the editor of Sheep magazine, who right. knew there was a magazine called Sheep! Exclamation um, mark. And apparently dying a sheep is no more dangerous than dying your own hair. So... Oh, right, okay. Yeah. It probably makes a very nice jumper. <laughs> um, yeah, and let's use peroxide, perhaps, then it, it does. Well, it has to be non-toxic, um, according okay. to Sheep magazine. All right, okay, let's get back to the uh, Guardian, because um, above the picture on the front page of the Guardian of the Chelsea pensioners who will be taking part in Lady Thatcher's funeral next week is the story about the big six energy firms accused of cold-blooded profiteering. Uh, Gideon. Well... Uh, with all the cold weather, the Guardian has um, got um, some figures from Ofgem, the industry regulator, which says profits per household have, uh, that is the profit that the big six energy companies get per household, has risen to £95 per year per and is household. That, is that pure profit or is that, is that going to be invested back into, into infrastructure and things or is this what then gets passed down to shareholders as dividends and things? Um, I, the impression I've got from this, and it's not 100% clear from the story, is that it is simply the profit that they've made after presumably they've invested in things as well, um, i.e. the cost of running their business. Um, and it uh, means that uh, the profit margin is 7%. Now, to me, a profit margin of 7% is not enormous. I think that it is a controversial issue, and they're saying that the profit margin was 3.5%, and it's doubled. But um, I do think the background to this is important, that not all the energy companies have been seen to be playing fair. And last week, one of them, SSC, you may remember, was fined £10 million yeah. pounds over mis-selling, and, and they admitted that. So therefore, um, if you like, the backdrop to this, cold-blooded profiteering, there's, it, I mean, the regulator is pushing hard on these on these companies, and that's probably a good thing. Yeah, Vicky, I mean, what are your thoughts, Kevin? Very emotive language, but as you say, though, a cold snap, elderly, potentially Difficult. losing winter fuel allowance. I mean, it hasn't been announced, but, you know, that, that is something Absolutely. in terms of and the time of austerity. Absolutely, a great quote from the fuel poverty action um, here saying that most people have to choose whether to heat or eat in these kind of situations. Um, part of it doesn't add up to me, and I say I actually agree with Gideon. It says that people are actually going to be paying an extra £95 a year, and it's a little bit difficult to, to kind of add that up as dramatic, mm. but every little seems to make a difference. Well, yeah, it's a really you consider, tough time. when consider, you consider the numbers of people who've got yeah. these sort of dual Just think that at the moment well. either it would be staying the same or going down, okay. ideally. Um, let's move on to uh, the Telegraph, because we saw the picture on the front page of The Guardian of the Chelsea Pensioners. Uh, Telegraph's got quite a few details, uh, Vicky, here about the service itself, uh, and what comes across really is a very strong um, sense of Christianity. It does, yeah. So this is a story saying that um, Lady Thatcher has planned her own funeral right down to the hymns and uh, the details and just seems very fitting and in, in keeping with her you know she really knew what she wanted in in life and uh, in death so uh, it's, uh, it's a christian funeral there's a quote in here that said that her funeral is not conservative it is christian there's no political eulogy and uh, it's got a real variety of readings uh, a sermon by um, bishop richard chartres archbishop Char chartres uh, the bishop of bishop, bishop, bishop of london, london. Yep. so uh, my my take on this is actually that she does come across as a real person of faith and that her her desire for a funeral wasn't to give a final st stake in the ground saying you know this is a political statement mm. it's actually to say this is my faith and i think that's quite yeah and gideon i mean it's a bit of controlling over her you know she, she obviously had planned quite carefully for this and, and actually that's not that unusual is it people wanting to know you know wanting people to know precisely what their last wishes are no, I think it's it's all pretty reasonable to me, and I mean it says that she stipulated that the Prime Minister of the day, who happens to be David Cameron, um, should um, give a reading, and uh, it's uh, according to this the Telegraph, uh, Lady Thatcher's granddaughter Amanda, who is a 19, will also um, read another lesson. Um, I, I mean, yes, the hit choice of hymns, I vow to thee, my country, to be a pilgrim, love divine, all loves excelling. 
I mean, those yeah, are all the, all the all classics. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but yeah. but um, I mean, if we can take a step back from this, it's a funeral, and I I, I think most sensible people can recognise that it, it's a, a, sounds like it's going to be a fairly straightforward service, and I think it should be treated like that. After mm. all, um, you know, if people want to protest and buy songs, they can do that. They don't have to do that during the service. No. OK, let's go back to the sun. We're running out of time. But uh, this story about uh, G4S uh, to having a role in the Jimmy Savile sex quiz. Uh, what do you think of this, Vicky? Um, I think it's interesting. So most of us looking back at the Olympics would remember G4S as the security form, the firm that really did uh, make quite a big bungle and didn't really inspire mm. any confidence. So this to me is... And, and not the most polished performance in front of the Parliamentary Committee. By no, no. And I think when you're <clears> dealing with, with victims of sexual um, abuse, that to me means the stakes are so high and you have to get it right. And I can see why people would be outraged at this. I think, you know, obviously a firm like that deserves a second chance. It's not that we're trying to be cruel, but I think when you're dealing with such a sensitive issue, you have to be employing people who have a great track record. So I can see why people are very concerned. Final, final thought from you, Gideon? Um, well, I think that they give them a chance. I mean, it was uh, ridiculous to think that uh, they have somehow completely ruined everything by um, the, the Olympics. They obviously have got rid of some of the people involved in that. They run many different things. Um, I can, you well, can they, be they, sure. They employ tens of thousands of people. Yeah, you can be sure that if, if they get it wrong, then you, they will lose every government contract going. Uh, but I, I, uh, let's hope, because it's a very serious story, let's hope that whatever the help the police need, they get it. All right. We're out of time. Very nice to see you. Thank you for uh, taking us through your section of the first edition.